Well, I'd like to welcome the uh, prospective students. Uh, I, I won't say the word Yaley prematurely, but I, of course I hope you all come. And uh, I wish I had a chance to provide a little context for what I'm going to say today, but uh, maybe you'll scramble into some sense of things as we go along. Uh, this, this lecture uh, concerns uh, an essay uh, written to immediate uh, widespread acclaim and controversy by two young, um, at the time quite uninfluential and untenured scholars trying to make their way in the world. Um, they certainly succeeded with this, with this essay, uh, which was published in Critical Inquiry, then certainly the leading uh, organ for the dissemination of innovative theoretical ideas. And they were, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, gratified by the results. Almost immediately, the editors of Critical Inquiry decided to publish, together with Against Theory in book form, decided to publish a series of responses to Against Theory, all of them sort of polite, uh, careful, uh, thought through responses, which made a very interesting thin book. Uh, which, uh, uh, which, you, which is, is still available. I think it's still in print um, and well worth having if you take an interest in the controversies that the, that, that the article generated. And of course, I'm hoping uh, in the time remaining to get you to take an interest in them. Uh, Knapp and Michaels were then, still are, uh, what's called neo-pragmatists, which is to say, uh, they are influenced most immediately by an important book uh, written in the 1970s by the philosopher Richard Rorty called Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. Uh, but, but Rorty writing in a tradition that goes back through the important work of John Dewey in the 1930s and 40s, uh, and before then, uh, not only to the great philosophical interventions of William James, Henry James's brother, uh, but also a theory of signs by Charles Sanders Peirce, um, a theory, P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, a theory which at the time uh, didn't generate uh, too much recognition or controversy. It was taken up by the so-called Cambridge School of Literary Critics, headed by I.A. Richards. He and C.K. Ogden uh, wrote some reflections on Peirce's semiotics, but today, with Pragmatism, neo-pragmatism, uh, a fairly important strain in academic, <coughs> theoretical, and literary thinking. Uh, Peirce's semiotics is, in a way, receiving more attention. Uh, uh, in a way, it's I in a way also challenging the hegemony in the field of literary theory of Saussure's semiotics. This sense of the sign as something different from what Saussure said it was is going to be the underlying theme of the central, the second and central part of, of this lecture. 1982 was probably the high watermark both of the fascination and the frustration with literary theory in this country. It was a hot button topic. Uh, we've gone into this before in ways that it is not really today, that our, our interest in literary theory is at least in part historical, one might want to say. Uh, in 1982, though, where you stood on these matters just made all the difference. And it was in that atmosphere that Knapp and Michaels' Against Theory uh, was published. Now, as I say, they were neo-pragmatists, and what that means basically is that one knows things, which is the same thing as to say that one believes things. One acts in the world unhesitatingly as an agent. It all sort of e e everything that matters in being human has to do with one's powers of agency but that there are no actual foundations in what we can know objectively for our beliefs and actions. In other words, it's a position uh, which is called anti-foundational or anti-foundationalist, but not a position that, as such a position might imply, uh, somehow entails nihilism or a kind of crippling radical skepticism. Uh, on the contrary, it's a position that insists that we just do what we do. 
that we are always doing, thinking, believing, saying something, that we are always uh, exerting an influence um, as social beings in our surroundings, uh, and that the only thing that needn't concern us about our powers of agency is that perhaps we don't really have a full, adequate, an objective account of how and why it is that we do and say and believe and influence things in the way that we do. So that, the, that, that position is essentially the position taken up in Knapp and Michaels. Now you saw it last time already uh, in the essay of Stanley Fish. Stanley Fish, who takes it that we are largely produced by the interpretive community to which we belong, uh, his understanding of this community as that which constitutes our values, in other words, nothing intrinsic to ourselves, uh, nothing unique in our own modes of perception, but rather the ways in which our educational circumstances uh, uh, bring us to believe and understand things. This too is a neo-pragmatist position. Now you notice that in the third part of the Knapp and Michaels essay, uh, they engage in a kind of polite disagreement with Fish. Uh, they are under, there is an underlying, very broad disagreement with him, but remember in the third part of the essay they're talking about the synonymity, the identity of knowledge and belief, and they point to a particular passage in one of Fish's arguments where he kind of slips in to the idea uh, that on the one hand you have knowledge and then the, on the other hand you have in relation to that knowledge uh, belief. And they say, no, 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 you can't separate knowledge and belief, um, and just on those grounds they disagree with Fish. And Fish writes one of the responses uh, in the book that's then subsequently published uh, concerning against theory, but it's a completely friendly controversy about a, a, about a, a, a transitory and superficial matter. Um, and as a matter of fact, well, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to the first two arguments. There, there are basically three arguments in this essay. I'm going to pay very little attention to the third argument in which Fish is engaged about the relationship between knowledge and belief, um, in part at least because it's an argument that does belong to philosophy. Uh, it is the cornerstone of Rorty's argument in Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature and uh, that perhaps not so immediately relevant uh, to the kinds of things that we think about in doing literary theory. So to turn then to uh, what they actually uh, do say uh, and in relation to this movement that I'm talking about, you notice, for example, that in tone their work is very similar to that of Stanley Fish. Uh, it's a kind of a downright, uh, no-nonsense, um, let's get on with it kind of tone that after reading you know, Derrida and, 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 and other writers of that kind, uh, you're perhaps not quite ready for, oh yeah, prose can be like that too. Um, and in a way it's bracing. I mean, it, it, it must be kind of a relief um, uh, to get these, this sort of no-nonsense attitude toward these issues after all the tacking and veering that we're likely to have experienced uh, in earlier writers. So the tone, in, in, in a way, the tone comes with the territory. You take these views and in a way the tone seems to follow it from it because what they're saying is, you know, you just do what you do. You think what you think. As a literary interpreter you're bound to have some opinion about what you're looking at it, so just get on with it. Express that opinion and that's your job of work. The only way you can go wrong on this view and in this tone, the only way you can go wrong is to grope around for some theoretical justification <laughs> for what you're doing. It's just fine that you're doing it. Don't worry about it. Get on with it. But don't think, uh, according to the argument of Knapp and Michaels, that you can hope to find anything like uh, an underlying or broad theoretical justification for what you're doing. Obviously um, that rather challenging and provocative uh, notion is something that lends itself readily to the sort of no-nonsense tone that I'm talking about. Okay, so turning then to, to their argument. They, ar they, they argue that people become entangled with issues of theory 
all of which in their view should be avoided when they do two – when they, well, three, but as I say, we're going to set knowledge and belief aside – when they make three fundamental mistakes. And the first uh, is to suppose that there's a difference between meaning. In other words, for example, to know a meaning you have to be able to invoke an intention on the one hand, or uh, in the absence of an intention uh, we cannot possibly speak of a meaning on the other hand. That's their first argument. People get become embroiled in theory when they make one of those two mistakes, and we'll come back to uh, that in a minute. The second argument is uh, the insistence that there's no such thing as a difference between language and speech. In other words, the Saussurean idea that we have language somehow or another virtually present in our heads as a lexicon and a set of rules of grammar and syntax, and that that language, long, produces speech, what I say from sentence to sentence, parole, that this notion is simply false because there is no difference between language and speech. That's their, that's their second premise. Now, before I launch into those arguments, let me say one more thing about their attitude toward theory. Let me call your attention to the very first paragraph which uh, in your pamphlet is on page 079, the very first paragraph of Against Theory, where interestingly they exempt certain ways of thinking about literature, certain quasi-scientific ways of thinking about literature from their charge against theory. They say the term theory is sometimes applied to literary subjects with no direct bearing on the interpretation of individual works, such as narratology, stylistics, and prosody. Despite their generality, however, these subjects seem to us essentially empirical, and our arguments against theory will not apply to them. Well, now, this is a little surprising because, I mean, for one thing, in this course, which is presumably devoted to theory, we've talked about some of these things, especially about narratology, stylistics, which is, um, you know, the, the, the science of style and how one can approach style syntactically, s statistically, and in the variety of ways uh, in which that's done, and poetics, which is general ideas about what constitutes uh, a poem or a text written in some other genre, um, which, which, all of which, for, for example, must remind us very much of the Russian formalists. Uh, narratology, as we studied it, it's largely derived from structuralism, indeed also from certain ideas of Freud, uh, and all of this sounds suspiciously like theory. What point are they making about it? Well, simply the point that w those ways of thinking about literature which they exempt from their diatribe against theory are the ways that they call empirical, ways of thinking about literature that are based on observation, and that of course would certainly, it seems to me, apply to the Russian formalists, at least what the Russian formalists think they're doing. Uh, Ways that are empirical in the sense that they observe data, they build up a kind of database, and they generalize from what they have observed. They begin, uh, in other words, with the object in question uh, and then draw conclusions from it. So empirical approaches to literature, the simple observation of data from which one can generalize, uh, they exempt from the general charge against literary theory. All right, turning then uh, to the idea that intention and meaning just must be the same thing, uh, and then subsequently the idea that language and speech just must be the same thing. In the background, I'd like you to be thinking about some of the implications of this sentence by Stanley Cavell, which is written in another one of the responses to this essay that was published in the book Against Theory. I don't want to reflect on it now, um, but um, it's, uh, it seems to me um, 
uh, a strikingly vivid way of posing a challenge to the Knapp and Michael position, uh, which um, in a variety of ways, uh, if only by implication, we'll be touching on. All right, so what do Knapp and Michaels do in order to convince us? And I'm, and I'm going to be going a long way with them here. Uh, indeed, almost all the way, even though I'm going to be taking a sharp turning toward the end of the road, which I hope saves theory. I, I mean, after all, I mean, I, it, 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 it's scarcely conscionable to stand here uh, sort of 26 times in front of you for an hour at each and then finally to confess at the end that the thing we've been talking about should be banished from our vocabulary. <laughs> and so, 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 so needless to say, it's incumbent on me to save our subject matter. I will, but you're going to have to wait a while because, as I say, I am going to be going uh, a long way down the road with Knapp and Michaels. Knapp and Michael say, well, you know what? The thing about the way in which we, we, we approach any text, any utterance, any instance of language floating before us is just to take for granted that it has an intention. As theorists and critics, we worry away at the question of how we can know attention, etc. And, and, and all of this uh, is, is, is a dangerous mistake uh, because the fact is, in everyday practice, any piece of language we encounter, we just assume to have an intention. All right, so they give us an example in which this assumption is tested and makes us realize what's at stake in supposing that we know the meaning of something. Ordinarily, we just spontaneously say, I know what that means, or if we don't know what it means, uh, it must mean something even though I don't know what it means. That's, I mean, th 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 that's our normal uh, approach to a piece of language. But then they say, suppose you're walking on the beach and you come across uh, four lines um, – uh, lines is already a dangerous thing to say – scratches in the sand that look an awful lot like the first stanza of Wordsworth's A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal. A slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of human years, of earthly years. There it is on the beach, just right in front of us. And we say, oh, well, somebody's come along, some Wordsworth lover has come along here and scratched these lines in the sand. So that the intention of the text is unquestioned. Wordsworth wrote it. Uh, somebody now wants us to remind us of how of what a wonderful stanza it is, and, and there it is. And of course, um, it's very difficult to know what it means, but at least I can ascribe meaning to it because no doubt, you know, it's an intended text. Whoa, but then what happens? Huge wave comes along and leaves on the beach underneath the first stanza, the other stanza. And, you, uh, and, this, of, uh, and, and this, of course, is highly problematic. Uh, you know, there it is, no motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees, rolled round an earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Now we're really puzzled. Maybe, as Knapp and Michael say, the sea is a kind of a pantheistic being that likes to write poetry, uh, you know, so that the sea wrote it. Maybe, they say later on, there are little men in a submarine, you know, who, uh, who, who uh, look at their handiwork and say, gee, that was great, let's try that again. Um, in other words, we can infer um, all sorts of authors for the stanza. But it's much more likely that instead of saying the sea writes poetry, or instead of saying there are little sort of homunculi in submarines writing poetry, instead of saying that, it's much more likely that we'll say, this is an amazing coincidence, truly amazing, but it's just a coincidence. What else could it be, we'll say. Knapp and Michaels' point, which was the same point that you, might, that, that you might make about a parrot saying, my boss is a jerk, for example. You know, you know the parrot doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, the, parrot is just, the parrot is just making words. Somebody else meant it, maybe, but the parrot is just, you know, that's just words for the parrot. 
Okay, or monkeys at typewriters writing Shakespeare. You know, we're, we're told that um, given eternity, this is a task that could be accomplished, always supposing somebody were there to whisk away the sheets whenever they wrote a word and finally put it back together. You know, all of this, uh, uh, these things are possibilities, but we suddenly realize that those texts, my boss is a jerk, a slumber did a spirit seal written by chance. By whatever it is, and it's and already there's a sort of an intentionality entailed in the idea of writing by something, but just left by chance, uh, we suddenly realize, according to Knapp and Michaels, that in that case, those words are only like language. They are not actually language because nobody wrote them. Nothing wrote them. No entity or being from God on down, wrote them. They are just there by chance. Therefore, even though they look like language, we suddenly realize that it would be foolish to, po to suppose that they have meaning. I mean, they, it, there is a poem that exactly resembles this bunch of marks that we see in front of us, and that poem has meaning, but this bunch of marks does not have meaning. Now, I think probably most of us, and, I, and that's why I think in a way Knapp and Michaels could have chosen a better example, I think probably most of us would resist the idea that we can't interpret the bunch of marks. They're identical to language. We, we feel free to interpret them. After all, nobody knows what the poem means anyway. I mean, it's, 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 it's been the subject of critical controversy for decades. That's one of the reasons Knapp and Michaels choose it. Um, and so, okay, there it is on the beach. I'll have my stab at it. You know, it must mean something, so here it goes. Uh, and, and, and so we resist that. That's why I gave you this other example, because it seems to me, in a way, the other example is more compelling than that of Knapp and Michaels. Now, you see these two ladies looking up at the tree. The upper, what do you call them, boluses? What, what, what do you call those? You, the branches sewed off, and eventually there's a kind of a scar formed. What's, what's, what? Pardon? Burl. Uh, the upper burl <laughs> certainly looks an awful lot like Jesus. <laughs> and it was, and these, and and this went, and when this appeared in Milford about 15 years ago, um, not just these two ladies, but hundreds and hundreds of people visited the site. Now, they, of course, believed that that was on the tree because God put it there. Therefore, it had meaning. We knew what it was. It was a representation of the face of Jesus. And, 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 and the feeling that one could know what it was, interpret it, take it to be an actual representation of something, was therefore unquestioned, as we would all agree. You accept the premise, God wrote it, or I should say put it there, uh, at, at a, he's been known to do the same thing with toasted cheese sandwiches and tacos, and so and, you know, <laughs> it, 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 happen, it happens, right? You, you accept that premise. And you're all set. But suppose you say, no, 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 God didn't write that. God didn't put that there. It's just an accident. Wouldn't you then say, oh, therefore it has no meaning. It's not a representation of anything. It just looks like something. In other words, in this case, However you feel about a slumber did my spirit seal, in this case you would accept Knapp and Michael's argument. You would say it really does depend on the inference of an intention. If I, in, if I infer no intention, I ascribe no meaning. If I infer an intention, I ascribe meaning. So Knapp and Michaels are simply making the same argument about a slumber did my spirit seal. And I think it's a very strong argument. You know, once you realize, or once I should say, you accept the idea that meaning just is intention, and think about it etymologically. When I say I mean, that precisely means I intend. Right? It's not doesn't quite work that way in all languages, but it certainly works that way in English. Uh, and it's worth remembering: to mean is to intend. 
And so it makes a lot of sense to say that a meaning just is an intention and that it's perhaps against the grain of common sense to factor them apart, to say, well, I could see, uh, you know, I could see this sentence and I have a certain notion what it might mean, but I still don't know what the author intended to say, which is forbidden from the standpoint of Knapp and Michaels. Of course you know what the author intended to say, you've just described meaning to the sentence. Now mind you, you may be wrong, <laughs> right? But that isn't to say that your being wrong hinges on knowing what the author intended. In a certain sense, Knapp and Michaels agree perfectly well with the new critics and with Foucault or whoever it might be uh, and say, well, you never know what an author intended. Um, that's not the point. The meaning of the sentence in itself entails intention. If it weren't a sentence spoken intentionally by an agent, human or otherwise, it wouldn't have meaning because it wouldn't be language. And in a certain sense, this then can carry us to our second argument. Because having established in their own minds satisfactorily that for any text, the meaning of the text ju must just be its intention. In other words, to be understood as language at all, to repeat myself once again, to be understood as language at all, an intention needs to be inferred. The argument being, you know, we ought to be able to recognize, supposing we succeed in not inferring an intention that what we are looking at is actually not language. It's just a simulacrum of language, an effective copy of language, like, for example, the speech of a parrot or the words produced by monkeys on typewriters and so on. We should not, from such simulacra of words, infer not only intention but meaning as well. It is meaningless to speak of marks that are not signs as language. Okay, bring us, bringing us to the notion of sign. For C.S. Peirce, who actually discriminated among hundreds of different kinds of sign, <laughs> all signs are active. That is to say, they have an agency, they have a purpose, they have a function. Peirce, in other words, does not understand them as, as, as the, in the way that Saussure does as being differential. He understands that too, but for him the central point about a sign is, it's, is, is the agency of the sign. All right, now the implication of this is clear, and it's the implication that Knapp and Michaels draw on in this argument. Their claim is that there is no distinction to be made between language and speech. Now, first, now, now let's just pause over their argument, and I would think the fact that as we think about that, especially since we've been exposed to Saussure and, 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 I, th and I hope have come to accept the idea that language is a virtual, synchronic uh, entity laid out in space and speech is an actual diachronic performance derived from language laid out in time, right? Since we have absorbed that and since we just have this sort of spontaneous, if we're students of literary theory, uh, belief that there is a distinction between language and speech, what do we do when we come face to face with this claim of Knapp and Michaels? Now, I think that they make, the, they, they make their most effective case in a footnote, uh, this is the last footnote I'll be calling your attention to this semester, uh, and it's like all footnotes, uh, perhaps the most telling thing in the essay, uh, and it appears on page 08. Why can't I find it? On, on page 084, footnote number 12. Not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a single sentence. Uh, at the top on page 21, footnote 12, in which they say, a dictionary is an index of frequent usages in particular speech 
acts, not a matrix of abstract, pre-intentional possibilities. Think about that. Language, we suppose, is in addition to being uh, a set of gr grammatical and syntactical rules, also a set of definitions made available for speech acts. That's, that, that is the assumption that a course in literary theory provides for us. Knapp and Michaels are denying that in this footnote. They're saying that dictionary definitions are just a sum total, as it were, of words in action, that any definition is of a word which is already a speech act. OED, you go through all 18 definitions of a word, they're all of them uh, embedded in sentences, speech acts, and can be taken out of sentences uh, and still understood in their agency as performed. Any word in a dictionary, in other words, according to, to, to Knapp and Michaels, is a word performed, and the record uh, fossilized, as it were, in the dictionary is a record not of meaning per se, but of performance, of the way in which the word works in speech, in history. And so a dictionary is nothing other than a composite or sum total of speech acts. And to distinguish, therefore, between language as something which is pre-action and speech, which is the implementation of language, is a mistake. Language, even in the sense that it's always there before us, is nevertheless always active. It is a record of those actions that have taken place before our own actions as speakers. There's no difference between me acting through speech and language pre-existing as something which is not action. It's all continuous as an ever-deepening, broadening, and self-complicating record of action or speech action. Now this is a very interesting idea, uh, and I think, again, it's an idea that one might well go a long way, a long way with. I think it should be said in defense of Saussure, by the way, that in a certain way he anticipates this position. Remember I told you that although for purposes of learning to understand structuralism and its aftermath, we only distinguish between language and speech, langue and parole. But in Saussure there's actually a third category, a sort of intermediate category, which he calls langage. And langage is actually the sum total of all known speech acts. If you could codify or, or, or quantify everything that's ever been said or written, that would be langage. You can see how it's different from long, which needn't necessarily ever have been said at all. I'll be coming back to that in a minute. Uh, langage, in other words, is empirical, as Knapp and Michaels would say. It is something that, had we enough information, we could actually codify into a vast database. It would be the sum of all speech acts. And that, actually, what Saussure calls langage, would be not unlike what Knapp and Michaels mean by language. You see, so, 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 so Saussure is aware that you can think of the sum of speech acts in the way that Knapp and Michaels do, but he still holds out for this other category, this, this, this notion of long, uh, 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 as uh, the code from which speech acts are derived uh, as a thing apart. Now, I think, as I say, um, this is a persuasive position because, after all, as long as we suppose that language exists for communication, that it is interactive, as long as we accept, as we have accepted from Bakhtin and others during the course of the course, as long as we accept, accept the idea that language is social, that all of its deployments um, are interactive, uh, derived from the speech acts of others, uh, appropriated for oneself as one's own set of speech acts, influential on yet other people as a speech act, as long as we accept this, we say to ourselves, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to think of language as inseparable from speech. 
uh, to think of language simply as the sum of all agencies, uh, so that no meaningful distinction between that sum of agencies and that in the individual agency of a speech act uh, needs to be made. Notice though, and, and here by the way is where I'm going to make my turn and save theory, so okay, sharpen your pencils. Um, Notice that I began that last riff by saying, as long as we suppose language exists for communication. Now, we do suppose language exists for communication. I mean, what else could it exist for? I mean, what do we do with language except to communicate? Uh, you know, you could say, well, we write doodles, we, we make meaningless marks in the sand. There are all kinds of things that maybe we do with language, but let's face it, we don't. Right? If, I, if, if I do, in fact, make marks in the sand amounting to a slumber did by spirit seal, it, it's because I, I love Wordsworth, as by the way I do, uh, and I wish to communicate that love to the rest of the world. You know, I mean, it's a speech act. Come on, I'm not just making marks. If I wanted to make marks, I'd do, you know, I'd do something you know, uh, rather more mark-like. Well, so, <laughs> so, so in any case, I, I, in any case, um, we certainly inhabit a life world in which it is almost inconceivable for anyone to come along and tell us language is not for the purpose of communication. In other words, Knapp and Michael seem to be completely right. What else is it for? I mean, you know, I mean, that's what we use it for. We have refined it uh, to a fairly well as an efficient, uh, flexible, sometimes even eloquent medium, medium of communication. That's what language is for, that's what it exists for. And as I'm saying, if we accept this idea, which seems simply to carry the day because who could think anything else? If we accept this idea, then there's a very strong case for Knapp and Michaels being right. Really there's no significant or important difference between language and speech. But now, <coughs> suppose we approach the question from a, I don't say from an empirical, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> uh, from a speculative, anthropological point of view. In other words, uh, but, but suppose we approached it but with, some, with some rather common sense remarks. Now we say language is for communication. The purpose of language is for communication. We say that. Now, does that mean? especially if we think of the whole history of mankind, does that mean that the purpose of fire is for cooking? In other words, or to br bring it a little bit closer to home, does it mean that the purpose of the prehensile thumb is for grasping? Does it mean that the purpose of a cave, a hole in the rock, is for dwelling? No. In those cases, adaptation is what makes fire a good thing to cook with, the prehensile thumb a good thing to grasp with, and a cave a good thing to take shelter in. But they all, in their various ways, are just there. Plainly all of them have other, well, not purposes, because a purpose is, is when you think about it, only something that we can impose on something. But they certainly are not there in any sense for us to do the thing that it turns out we, we've decided it's a good idea to do with it. Right? You know, great, you know, fire burns us, but it, what we can cook with it, you know, and, 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 and so on. Now, in the case of language, in the case of language, we have to suppose, as a matter of fact, that language, as it were, appears among us in the same way that the prehensile thumb did. Of course, we discovered its use, but that's a funny way to put it. Might be more circumspect to say that we discovered it had a use for us, which was to communicate. And so once we were able to put this, whatever it was, this, this, this weird capacity to make differential sounds, uh, once we put this weird capacity to make differential sounds to work, henceforth, for us and for our purposes, 
Language was to communicate. And of course, we made an enormous success of it, or a Tower of Babel of it, which, whichever you prefer to think. <laughs> but in any case, we have it, uh, and it has developed among us as a means or medium of communication. But, you know, I mean, if uh, in whatever, by whatever mutancy, uh, language arose, supposing this to be the case, and, and you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not making an argument that has anything to do with intelligent design one way or another. Supposing, supposing that by whatever mutancy, um, language appeared, and then of course the next day there were an avalanche, right? It might well be the case that the species, uh, consisting of all of us sitting in this room and I guess a few other people, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that this species uh, might be mute. It might be communicating, perhaps with incredible eloquence, perhaps even with literary genius, by means of signs, or who knows, or for that matter, it might have taken a detour in its development such that communication was not anything one could identify as specifically human. Uh, all, all sentient beings communicate, uh, but it's possible that this particular species could have taken a turn in its development, uh, after which communication was much as it is among mice or ants or, 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 or whatever. Uh, all of this is possible, you see, when we think about language a property that we have and manipulate and communicate with uh, anthropologically. It comes into being in such a way that it is, I would think, scarcely relevant to say that its purpose is for communication. It comes into being simply as an attribute, a property, something we happen to have, something someone happens to have, for which a use is then discovered, as for fire, for the prehensile thumb, and for the cave. I mean, the relationship between the cave and the house, it seems to me, is a particularly interesting way of thinking about the relationship between language as a set of differential signs. And notice something about the signs of language, and here, of course, we, we also invoke so sir. So Sir lays every stress on the idea that language is made up of differential and arbitrary signs. In other words, So Sir denies that there is such a thing in language as a natural sign. In other words, the, and the Russian formalists do this as well. Both So Sir and the Russian formalists warn us against believing that onomatopoetic devices, peep peep peep, devices like that are actually natural signs, that they are derived, in other words, from the thing in the world that they seem through their sound to represent. So Sir reminds us that these are ac accidents of etymological history which can also be understood in adaptive terms. Onomatopoeia exists in language because it's good for communication and it's fun to communicate with, but it doesn't enter language as a natural sign. It only passes through moments in the, in the evolution of a given word, it only passes through moments in which the relationship between the sound and the thing represented seems to be natural. This is a matter upon which great stress is laid, both for Saussure and for the Russian formalists. You may, you may have thought when you read these, the, these passages in which such stress is laid on it, you may have thought, well, that's overkill. Who cares about onomatopoeia? What does that have to do with it? It, it, it anchors the entire idea about language, which is precisely that it is something other than speech. When we speak, we not only endeavor to communicate, we endeavor to refer. In other words, we take language and we try to make it, as the philosophers say, hook on to the natural world. We take a set of signs, a code, which is not in itself natural, which is arbitrary, and through the sheer force of will, we make those signs as best we can hook on to the natural, to the actual world. And in doing so, we reinforce the idea 
that language is for communication. Whereas my argument is language isn't for communication, speech is. When we speak, that is entirely and exclusively and without any other motive for communication. Except for one thing that the Russian formalists in particular took note of. There are funny things going on, going on in our speech. Alliteration, unnecessary or uneconomical forms of repetition, weird things going on in our, in our speech which don't seem to have the purpose of communication. As a matter of fact, they actually seem to impede communication. You know, if I, you know, when I, when, when I really start messing language up, you know, twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the way. When I really start messing up language up, I'm really, I'm impeding communication because I'm laying stress on elements of rhythm, pattern, sound recurrence, uh, which cannot be said to have any direct bearing on communication. And this, of course, is what we've studied recurrently, and I have to say empirically, <laughs> because these are all empirical facts about language, as, as the Russian formalists insisted. You know, what we have studied recurrently is the way in which language rears its ugly head in speech. The way in which, in other words, language won't be repressed as mere communication. The way in which speech entails elements that keep bubbling up to the surface and asserting themselves, which oddly enough really can't be said to conduce to communication. And those things, those elements that bubble up to the surface are nothing other than, the, than evidence of the presence of language precisely in the way that in Freud, the Freudian slip, the fact that I can't get through a sentence without making some kind of blunder, some and very often an embarrassing blunder, in Freud, the Freudian slip is understood as the bubbling up into conscious, the conscious effort to speak of that which speech can't control, of that which Freud calls the unconscious. And which, by the way, we would have no idea of the existence of if it weren't for the Freudian slip. In other words, we, in, as Freud said in, in, in the first handout that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, we infer the unconscious from the behavior of consciousness because given the erratic nature of the behavior of consciousness, it seems necessary to do so. By precisely the same token, we can and I think should say, we infer language as something else from the composite or sum total as spe of speech acts. We infer language from the erratic behavior of speech because it seems there is no other way to account for the erratic behavior of speech. That sense of language, which I'm going to be talking a lot more about on Thursday, that sense of language sort of bubbling up and be from below in speech and proving its existence as something other than a composite record of all speeches is what suggests to us that Knapp and Weichel's uh, are not quite right in saying there's really no difference between language and speech. And if, there's really, and if there is a difference between language and speech, as I'm claiming, and if the difference between language and speech is much as we have taught to think of it by Saussure and his suc successors down through deconstruction, if there is such a difference, then guess what? We have literary theory back in the fold, alive and well, and we no longer have to say that it should be jettisoned from our thinking about literature. We have a real use for literary theory. But that's exactly where Knapp and Michael, supposing, uh, supposing they were here and I'd convince them, and by the way, I know them both, you can't convince them of anything, but that's not unusual, you <laughs> probably can't convince me of anything either. Um, uh, suppo suppose we had them here and I had succeeded in convincing them. They would say, well, okay, but isn't it a pity because you have proved better than I could that 
literary theory has no purpose. You know, why on earth should we worry about all this bubbling up of, of stuff that has nothing to do with communication? After all, we're here to communicate, aren't we? We've begun by saying that our life world consists precisely in the deployment of language for communication. And here's this person saying there's this stuff bubbling up, you know, I mean, which, which, which makes communication difficult. You know, what use is that, Knapp and Michaels might say? You see, they are pragmatists, aren't they? Right? They are, uh, they are pragmatists, or they are concerned with practicality. Their interest, their, th their reason for being interested in meaning and interpretation is a practical reading, a reason entirely entailed in the understanding of communication and the furtherance of communication. Whereas theory, which I have saved, I nevertheless seem to have saved at a pretty considerable cost, because I have suggested that theory itself is completely impractical. You know, I've suggested it. We're going to get back to that next time. That's what the Thursday lecture is going to be, going to be about. Um, but in the meantime, you say to yourself, okay, fine, we've got theory, but we've also been shown that you can't really do anything with it, um, and so uh, it might just as well um, suit us to suppose that Knapp and Michaels are right uh, and to proceed as though theory uh, could be jettisoned. Um, one last quick point. Going back to the distinction between meaning and intention, notice the two-pronged argument. On the one hand, people like E. D. Hirsch who believe that you can invoke an author's intention in order to pin down a meaning. On the one hand, you have people like that, and on the other hand, you have people doing deconstruction who say that because there is no inferable intention, texts themselves have no meaning. That's not quite right, because th that's not quite really what deconstruction says. Deconstruction doesn't say texts have no meaning. Deconstruction doesn't even say that you can't know what the meaning of a text is exactly. What deconstruction says is that you can't rope off meaning in a text. Texts have too much meaning. Texts explode with meaning. You can't corral the way in which texts uh, produce meaning. You can't corral it, corral it by inferring an intention. You can't corral it, corral it by taking a particular interpretive path. Meaning just explodes in text. That's not at all the same thing as to, as, as to say, uh, according to the claim of Knapp and Michaels, that in deconstructive thinking, texts have no meaning. A very, very different proposition uh, altogether. And I think it might suggest to you that the relationship between intention and meaning isn't really what's at stake in deconstruction. A, a text is intended, uh, or you can say, well, it may be intended. Uh, no doubt it's intended, all sorts of ways of putting it. But is that really the point? The text is the text on this view. And the text just, as I say, fairly bristles with meaning, that being precisely the point. You can't rein it in. That's not really the flip side, as Knapp and Michaels would, 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 would want to make you think. It's not really the flip side of the idea uh, of the followers of Hirsch uh, that in order to know a meaning, you have to be able to infer an authorial intention. There's no symmetry there. Uh, and as I say, I'm not sure that deconstruction, whatever its claims, whatever its perfections and imperfections, I'm not sure that really deconstruction has the question of intention in relation to meaning very much at heart one way or another. Sorry to have kept you. We'll see you Thursday.